Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will talk now about uh, the application of TEM for the understanding of the internal structure of different solid materials. So it's basically analysis of the crystallography of uh, materials. Well, just here you have an overview of my talk. I will start talking about the basic of a high resolution TM imaging and electron diffraction. Then I will talk about the simulation of a high resolution uh, TM images, uh, lattice uh, structural images. Also the application of a TM for an electron diffraction for the analysis of a structure. And finally, I will present you a, a few examples of the application of TM for the crystallographic study of different material. We talk about uh, non-classic crystallization, some microstructure in carbonates, uh, also in, in biominerals and biomimetics, and finally, a transformation reaction uh, within the TM. So just getting back to what uh, Oli showed you, uh, in the TM, we are using uh, uh, electrons for imaging sample. So basically we have the basic operation of the electron beam is a parallel beam that interact with the specimen with the sample. So the sample will have a particular structure and this structure will result in the formation of what specific uh, diffraction images. Um, this diffraction image uh, you can see here uh, through the different paths uh, of the electron diffracted will generate a structural image. So basically this uh, high resolution TEM image is the fast Fourier transform of the electron image. This is important to, to understand because we can play around using fast Fourier transform to convert electron diffraction images into structural image, lattice image. And in both ways, from here to the uh, diffraction pattern and the other way around. Remember that uh, in general, what I will talk about is uh, the analysis of the internal structure of material using parallel beam. So basically all the electron diffraction uh, concept that we will talk about is considering a parallel beam. But we have to consider that we can also use convergent beam. So we can have converging uh, electron diffraction, CBED, um, which is quite useful in specific cases, especially when we have very small uh, samples. So if we go into the basic uh, imaging modes that we can get with the TM, we have uh, basically two modes of uh, imaging bright field and dark field. In bright field, we can have images of the sample by different type of contrast. So we can have an amplitude contrast. Uh, the contrast depend on the atomic number, the thickness of the specimen and the orientation of the sample. So here you see an example of this uh, amplitude contrast, just to, you can see the shape of uh, this nanocrystal, in this case, calcium, hydroxide. In bright field, we can also have phase contrast. In the case of phase contrast, this uh, contrast is due to the interference between the direct and the diffractive uh, beams. So basically what we have is a projection of the electrostatic potential of a particular uh, crystalline material along the direction of the incident beam. So the typical image that we can get by phase contrast uh, is, for instance, a lattice fringe, in this case of calcite. And you can see the distance between the different plane. That's the rhombohedral cleavage plane, the 104. Or we can see a more detailed, high resolution uh, image of a part other structure, in this case, a silicate, a cordiorite. And here you see imprinted the disposition of the different tetrahedra, the, the silica tetrahedra forming this ring, which is characteristic of this uh, mineral. The other mode for observing our sample is uh, using diffracted beams. So we can select a particular beam out of the diffraction pattern, for instance, in this case, the 0006 uh, 
being of a calcite or sorry dolomite and uh, imaging the uh, you can image the sample in what is called dark field just through that particular beam and this is what we see basically what we see is that the illuminated part the bright part are those that correspond to that particular orientation in the sample so anything that is dark in this uh, image correspond to a section a part of uh, a domain of this uh, crystal that is not oriented uh, in a proper way to produce uh, diffraction so in this case we have a completely different orientation than the 006 that produced the bright uh, imaging so in that field we can analyze for instance a sample microstructure and orientation of a particular set of crystals but there is electron diffraction and before we get into electron diffraction, we will go uh, very briefly about what is the phenomenon of diffraction. So we can have diffraction with different uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. For instance, we can have diffraction with light. And here you have a very simple example of how can we diffract uh, light, in this case, a laser beam. So if we uh, made a laser beam, a coherent, uh, being to go through a little hole, a pink hole, we can have a maxima of the light that is recorded in a, in a CCD or in a, a screen. And this maxima that are represented here in intensity, this is the maximum at the center, and then another secondary maxima, uh, different a radial distance from the center of the image are giving us the diffracted or known as airy rings collect due to the interference of the different rays that are scattered when they cross the, the pink hole. So this is a basic uh, example of diffraction for light, but we can go into a more complex situation. If we, instead of having a pink hole, we said a grid, and in this grid, we have a pattern that have a particular uh, characteristic distance between the different part of the, this pattern. Uh, and we modify the distance between this uh, grid, the, this line, let's say. Uh, in this case, they are separated uh, about like 12 micrometer, but we can have another grid with a closer, uh, the, the grid the lines closer to each other, about uh, three micron. When we made the laser to go through this grid, this is what we get. This pattern is uh, representing the intensity of the different beams that are scattered coherently by this uh, diffraction grid. And the separation between the different spot is proportional to the distance in this uh, grid. So in the distance in what we call real space is the reciprocal distance that we can see in the diffraction space, which is called the reciprocal space. In this case, when we have a separation between the grid, which is large, let's say in this case, 12 micrometer, the distance between the spot is very small. When we made the distance between the grid lines to be smaller, the distance in the reciprocal space is larger. So this is a basic point to understand electron diffraction. The distance between the different beams that have been diffracted is inverse or reciprocal to that in the real material, in the real space, in the real structure of a particular crystal, crystalline material. We can relate uh, the distance between the different spots that are diffracted or the different beams that are diffracted by the so-called Bragg law. The Bragg law links the, the wavelength lambda of uh, an incident beam, let's say electron, X-rays, or even light, and the distance, the characteristic distance between planes. In this case, if we talk about crystal, we talk about the distance between different crystallographic planes, HKL plane. And also is linking the diffraction angle theta. 
So this law is telling us that when we have a particular distance between different rows of atomic, uh, you know, atomic plane H scale, and we have an incident beam of uh, X rays or electron and hitting a top row, a middle row, or even a more interior row. Only we will have diffraction when the different rays interfere in a coherent, constructive way. And this only happens when the difference in their path is an uh, integral number and of the wavelength of the rays. In this image, what you see are, is the interference of two waves that, you know, that they cross uh, uh, this two spot and they made uh, this, if, you know, the propagation of the waves in this, from this spot and then the propagation of this other wave by this other spot and they interfere. And you can see that this interference occurs particularly strongly at particular angles. So these are the, uh, basically the theta angle for the case of constructive interference. You have to know that in every single material, in a, a crystalline material, in a mineral, we will have different atoms and the electrons surrounding the nucleus will act as scatter uh, point. So when they are hit by electromagnetic uh, radiation, X-rays or electrons, they will emit the radiation in a coherent way and that waves that are produced by every single electron in the surrounding of a particular uh, nucleus in an atom will interfere with the wave produced by the other electron from the other atom. So that interference can be constructive when the interference or is, is produced when it fits the Brock law and only when the difference in the path between one wavelength and the other is a number of the uh, wavelength. In this case, the waves are uh, in phase, so they add each other. However, if they are out of phase, they cancel each other and we will not have diffraction. So only for a specific angle to theta in this case, considering the angle between the incident beam and the diffractive beam, we will have this constructive interaction. We can work around in this uh, scheme just to calculate uh, from a very simple geometric uh, analysis that the path difference between ray one and the diffractive being one and ray two and the diffractive being two uh, is equal that, you know, the difference in the path is this distance and L plus LN, that distance is equal to uh, two times the interatomic uh, distance, the DHKL, uh, multiplying the scene of the theta angle. So this is the basic of the bracket diffraction that we apply to understand how the electron are diffracted by uh, a particular uh, crystal. So if we go back to the basic uh, of a diffraction in the TM, we can have a parallel beam or a convergent beam. You have a parallel beam when it interacts with this specimen, it will produce beams, diffracted beams that they are in a, they go in a different direction from the direct uh, beam and they produce this kind of pattern. This is for the case of the uh, sun axis, the one, one, one of a uh, silicon. If we have a convergent beam, we will have uh, also diffraction, but the diffraction will lead to the formation of different cones that hit the detector and they produce this kind of, of images. So they are diffraction discs. In this case, while in the parallel beam uh, standard scan uh, selected area electron diffraction, what we have are spots. Here we have another uh, view of how diffraction, in this case of what a parallel beam will take place. If we had the crystal, the electron beam will hit, and then we had different rays. The angular spreading, you know, the, the angle 
that each ray, diffractive ray forms with respect to the direction of the incident beam uh, will result in the formation of or the production of this diffractive spot. The distance between the diffractive, a particular diffractive spot and the center of the image here, which corresponds to the direct beam, the one that goes parallel to the incident beam, this distance R is proportional to the reciprocal of the D spacing of a particular crystallographic plane that is diffracted. So by knowing the distance between this diffracted spot and the center of the diffraction pattern, we can calculate the spacing between different HKL plane. We will see later on how we can do that. But we had to consider that when we had diffraction in the TN, uh, we have more generally scattering that in some cases can result in diffracting in a diffraction pattern, with particular intense uh, spot, or not. In the case of amorphous sample, in this case, uh, amorphous calcium carbonate, what we can have is diffuse ring, and these diffuse ring are uh, showing that the material doesn't have a long range uh, order. When we have a long range order and we talk about a crystalline material, we can have a single crystal, like in this case calcite, and this is a typical single crystal uh, electron diffraction pattern that we can collect from a particular orientation, in this case given by the zone axis of this uh, of this crystal that is oriented in that direction. We will see how can we calculate the zone axis uh, knowing the indexing of the different diffraction spot. We will see that later on. Also, when we have a crystal, uh, polycrystalline material, instead of having single spot, what we will have are rings, what are called the V rings each one with a particular radius. So knowing the radius, we can also get information about the D spacing in our uh, material. And from that, we can identify which phase do we have or which phases, if we have more than one phase in the sample. Also, if we uh, collect uh, the diffraction image from a sick specimen, what we can get instead of just single spot are, uh, is what is called a Kikuchi pattern or Kikuchi lines. So it can give us also information about what crystal do we have and what the orientation of that particular crystal is. To understand why in a selected area diffraction pattern, we have so many points that fulfill the requirement for diffraction according to the Brax uh, law, we have to think that in the reciprocal space, the reciprocal uh, lattice of a particular crystal is not defined by just single spot in these nodes of the reciprocal lattice. They are defined better by uh, what is called real rod. So they are like a rod elongated in a particular direction that made the condition for diffraction to happen not only at the center of the spot representing this node of the reciprocal lattice, but also along the whole real row. That means that when the electron beam goes into the sample, it hits a particular uh, order of the reciprocal lattice at several points at the same time. So instead of having just one single diffraction spot, from just illuminating the sample with our electron beam, we get a whole row of points that is now here represented by the different spot that you see in this projection of the, the reciprocal lattice and also the equivalent, which is the selected area electron diffraction part. If we get to hit by uh, the electron beam, and we meet the condition for diffraction along a whole sphere, which is called the diffraction sphere or a wall sphere, along different rows of the reciprocal lattice, 
we get different order of the fraction. This is our, what is called the Laue zone. We can have a zero order Laue zone. This is the center of the diffraction spot, which is what normally we get when we analyze a particular sample. But also we can have higher order Laue zone, first order, second order, and so on. This is again, because we are meeting the diffraction condition at different rows of the reciprocal lattice. And again, this is achieved when the equal sphere is touching every single spot of the reciprocal lattice representing the, the crystal. From the diffractive pattern, we can have uh, information about the de-spacing and what we do if we get a diffraction pattern like the one we see here we can uh, dry uh, we can draw different vector from the center of the image to the different spot and we can measure the distance of this different vector and using this equation that links uh, the real D spacing with the camera lens, that is a known factor for a specific TM, and the wavelength of the uh, electron. We can calculate, knowing the distance between reciprocal lattice spot, we can calculate the DHK uh, spacing. We can also measure the angle between the different vector, and from that we can also uh, have an idea of what uh, crystalline material do we have and also the indexing. Knowing also, we can even figure it out what is the unit cell and the space group. We can use uh, published uh, diffraction uh, patterns, for instance, like the JPDF uh, files where we list or are, they are listed the spacing for a particular crystal. Uh, the intensity of the diffraction spot and also the HKL parameter. So basically those data that are in the JPDF uh, file for uh, X-ray diffraction are useful when we are an ident identifying a phase uh, using electron diffraction. In the case of polycrystalline material, we proceed exactly the same, just measuring the radius of the different the V uh, range that we observe in the diffraction pattern. We can list them from the this highest uh, to the smallest uh, DHKL and then try to identify that uh, using uh, published uh, results for known minerals. One important point during the analysis of the material is to index the material. And the indexing is done by uh, analyzing the distance between the different spot in the diffraction pattern, you know, the different spot correspond to the lattice, uh, the reciprocal lattice. And then we can calculate the zone axis of the material by assigning the different HKL uh, values, the Miller indices. Uh, using this equation, we can know the zone axis. We can also simulate the diffraction pattern using uh, normally what is done nowadays is a computer program. We can select a particular seed IF file, the crystal data file for a particular phase, simulate the diffraction pattern for a particular zone axis, and then compare with our experimental data. We can also simulate high resolution TM images. And here we have example for the case of a mixed layer uh, eyelid SMEC type. A clay mineral. This is the basic structure and we can simulate along different direction in this crystal what will be um, the electrostatic potential for eyelite and esmectite in this uh, piling up along the c-axis and from that we can uh, simulate for different defocus uh, how the high resolution image will look like and here you see we have the structure of muscovite imprinted over what is the simulated uh, image, computer simulated image. And this is actually the image that we see in the TM. So we can really prepare a model for our structure and then uh, 
uh, check if that really corresponds to what we see in reality. We can use a also simulation of the diffraction pattern and also the high resolution TM imaging by collecting an image, doing the fast Fourier transform to get the simulated uh, electron diffraction pattern. We can decompose that pattern into different sections for different phases. And then from those electron diffraction pattern that are simulated, we can in, in doing an inverse fast Fourier transform, we can simulate the high resolution pattern of this different phase in a particular uh, sample. This is happening down in this case for the transformation of lime into porlandite, these two phases. And in this case, we have the coexistence of the two of them. And then we can identify one phase and separate that from the other. Another possibility of the use of uh, electron diffraction is to solve the structure of an unknown material. This is done, uh, for instance, by automatic electron diffraction tomography. So we had a nano beam that in, is uh, hitting the sample, and we are collecting a sequence of electron diffraction pattern while we are tilting, rotating the crystal along a particular axis. So we get this collection of image, and then we can identify different zone axes. And by analyzing the DHKL plus the intensity of the electron diffraction, we can solve uh, the structure. And here is an example, uh, very recent example on the analysis of a new structure for calcium carbonate, hemihydrate. This is the crystal observing the SCM in the TM. These are the pattern of the, the X-ray pattern compared uh, of this new crystal compared to known phases in the system like a batterite, calcite, or aragonite, which do not match this new crystal. And then by uh, performing electron diffraction in the way I told you before, automatic electron diffraction tomography, we can solve the structure. Here's the structure compared to that of a monohydrocalcite. So just to finish, some quick example of the crystallographic study that we can do of different materials. And we'll start with the analysis of non-classical nucleation, which is something, a very hot topic nowadays. So uh, these are observation of what is called pre-nucleation cluster that precede the formation of uh, calcium carbonate phase and these are supposedly identified using a cryo a, a transmission electron microscopies. They are nanoparticles, about one nanometer, two nanometer inside. And this is the pattern that we can collect from the intensity profile uh, for the scattering vector of this uh, particular. This is a controversial, and some people believe that they exist, other people do not believe. So. If we get into the same system, we can see that in the case of calcium carbonate, beside the pre-nucleation cluster, what we can have as a material, the a precursor to the solid phase, it can be a liquid. I've been uh, proposed that a liquid precede the formation of amorphous calcium carbonate. This is solid. And if we analyze the solid, the amorphous calcium carbonate, we can get important information from the electron diffraction pattern, even for this material that is amorphous, because we can simulate the scattering function of this uh, pattern and compare that scattering with that of uh, different phases that we believe uh, could be uh, formed after the amorphous calcium carbonate. In this case, uh, this particular amorphous calcium carbonate matches very well the scattering function of calcite and monohydrocalcite if we simulate the pattern considering that the crystallite size uh, for these two phases is one nanometer. So this is something that is eating into the understanding of the new route for crystallization of crystal by what is called a non-classical crystallization that goes instead of adding atom by atom to build the crystal, we have a precursor we had amorphous and then the transition to a crystalline phase. 
We can also see the grow of crystal in a non-classical way. Um, this is the case of the formation of mesocrystal. We can start with a set of nanoparticles that they self-assemble in a particular direction, and then they form the final crystal. And we can see that using, for instance, Creo uh, TM. And the interesting thing is that the final crystal that we observe is uh, may have morphologies that are not compatible with the structure, the crystalline structure of a particular phase. For instance, in the case of calcite, we can have an octahedral morphology that, again, is not compatible with the uh, rhombohedral structure. And if we analyze that in detail, we see that these mesocrystals are formed by individual nanocrystal that have assembled and diffract as a single crystal. So basically, we are having a, a large crystal that is made up of a very tiny uh, nanoparticle that they are uh, coalescing and they assemble in large scale. We can also analyze different uh, structures that are key to understand the growth condition and mechanism of different phases. For instance, we can see growth dislocation in carbonate. We can see twins in the same phases. We can see modulation, which are bands that are evident in the TM. And this is the bright field image. And they have a particular wavelength. They can be just one single set of this band or a cross uh, modulation. In this case, is what is called treat modulation that give us idea about the structure. We have to remember that in carbonate, for instance, we have A-type reflection, which are corresponding to calcite. B-type reflection or order reflection that are typical for, uh, for instance, dolomite, but also C-type and D-type. This one had to do with the ordering in the stacking of the different layer of carbonate and um, alkali, uh, alkaline earth metal for this or uh, divalent metal. If we talk about dolomite, it will be the alternated layer of calcium and magnesium. So we can have extra reflection because the lattice space is double or triple uh, due to this ordering or D-type that is talking before. And this is what we see. For instance, C domains are seen when we have a C-type reflection and may be due, although this is a matter of discussion, to anti-phase boundaries. For instance, we have the carbonate group oriented in an opposite way to the other carbonate group along the APV boundary. And this is what we see in the TM, doubling of the spacing. We can have a C type or sorry, D type reflection. They are extra reflection. Here you see very clearly this extra reflection due to the banding, apparent banding, but it's actually a modulation in dolomite. It can give you clues about the origin. And also, Growth zoning, we can see that at the TM level. Ribbons that are, in some cases, compositional variation. We're seeing a homogeneous phase in the case of dolomite that they are seen very nicely under dark field imaging. Deformation microstructure, so we can know about the dislocation that we can have in a deformed material, twins, dislocation plus the slip band in this case, and also twins that can be induced as an artifact while we are observing the sample. This is, we have to be very careful because this being damaged uh, induced twin uh, can be a problem. And finally, in the case of a biomineral, we can see also superstructure. We can see mosaic structure, like the different orientation in different part of the crystal, modulation. We see here modulation with the extra reflection. We can see also the grow of non-classical grow of crystal. For instance, in the uh, oyster, in the pear oyster, we see areas where are uh, amorphous. So we see crystalline part and amorphous part, and we can infer that the grow proceed via an amorphous precursor. We can see mesocrystal or mesocrystalline structure. In the case of the spicul of a, a sea urchin in the spine, we can see this kind of aggregate of crystal that tell us that at different level, we have different hierarchical uh, aggregation and orientation that give us basically a, a mesocrystal. 
In the case of uh, bacteria, we can see that they have S layer and they have this structure that can be mineralized and form this peculiar structure that we can reproduce in the lab via biomimetic synthesis. In the case of aragonite, uh, that is formed by this kind of brick and mortar structure, we can see that the mortar uh, the, or the growth, the bricks, take place via an amorphous uh, calcium carbonate that eventually transform into aragonite. And we can induce that transformation in the TM by electron beam. And we can see here how the originally amorphous has transformed into aragonite with different, slight different orientation, different part. Here we can also see modulations, superstructure in the case of a biogenic batterite that is uh, trying to imitate lackluster pearl uh, batterite. And also we can have a transformation within the TN due to being in interaction, inelastic, basically an elastic uh, electron uh, being interaction with the sample. We can have a specimen heating and also structural damage. We can break bond or produce new bonding. And this can be used to our advantage to study how a material behave or how phase uh, transition can occur. For instance, we can see evolution of the uh, C reflection, B reflection in a dolomite just by being damaged. In this case, it will be a very destructive effect. We don't really want that. But in other case, we can use that to see the transformation of one phase to another. For instance, the thermal decomposition of dolomite that have been a highly controversial topic over 100 years with different model proposed for the transformation into two carbonate uh, oxide plus a carbonate and two oxide uh, plus uh, in all cases uh, releasing CO2 in these two cases. In the TN, we can see if we start with dolomite and then we produce beam damage, we see the transformation in the electron diffraction from a dolomite pattern, typical for a uh, rhombohedral carbonate, into an oxide. And you see that the oxide is a single oxide which produce this spot. It's some mm, misorientation between the crystals, so it's not a perfect spot pattern, have some kind of like disk. And if we prolong the exposure to the electron beam, we see splitting of this spot into two uh, spots that give us an idea of what is going on. We start with the carbonate, we produce a mixed oxide, magnesium now calcium oxide, and finally, by spinodal decomposition, we separate two phases, calcium oxide and magnesium oxide. That's why we see double spot. And just Alex, to you finish, finish. I, I, am, I am finishing, sorry for the delay. We can see also a amorphous to crystalline transformation in the TM. We start with an amorphous, here's the uh, pattern, and we see the advance over time of a crystalline from that transformed the originally fully amorphous material into calcite. And here's the final spot pattern for this crystalline phase. So I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for, the, for standing a little.